Okay, I'm in chapter 12. Chapter 12 is my, my favoritist. It is my most favoritist of all of them. It is even more favoriter than chapter 11. I like this stuff, right? And some of you are obviously very good at this stuff, and some of you are, are lost. Uh, we need to think about how chemists and engineers and what I would call molecular engineers design material. How do they put these pieces together? We've spent the rest of the, the, the first part of the semester looking at all these reactions, these sort of very different reactions. We add things, we take things out, we do substitution and stuff like that. But there's been a goal here. The goal is to get to a point where we can start to use this stuff to build molecules. And this brings into all sorts of subjects. You can use this material in pharmacology, you can use it in, in molecular medicine, you can use it in uh, cell engineering, stuff like that. It's the basis of, of, of all those subjects. So we need to, in chapter 12, think about what we've done. There are no new reactions in 12. Right? So if you know what you're doing at this point, it's just putting it together. There are no new reactions. There is a lot of thinking. There is a lot of challenging you. Santiganters, over here. I really want you to pass. I do. Okay. Uh, we have to think about putting stuff together. We have to think about using what we've done. It's a bit different to other subjects. It's, it's like the capstone part of the semester. I, I want to point out some compounds that have been made by chemists in the lab. These are compounds that are made naturally. In the middle, you've got vitamin B12, which is an organometallic compound. You'll see more of next term and in biochem. Brevitoxin on the right, Brevitoxin B, is a massive polyether compound. And on the left, we've got ciguatoxin. If, if you have the word toxin in there, it's probably not very good for you. It's some kind of toxin. But these things have interesting biological properties and interesting uh, pharmaco pharmacological properties. So people make these things from scratch. And we'll talk next term about a technique to be able to go backwards from a target and work out what you should be doing to disconnect and deconstruct the molecule so you can go forward. In this semester, with a week left, you know, two weeks before an exam, we can't get you to be experts at this, but we can start thinking about what we're trying to do. We can start thinking about planning a synthesis, using tactics, using the chemistry that you know, and doing things in the right order so you get a good yield of the product. So we'll talk about these things next semester. Some of these things take 150 steps, 200 steps from the first uh, compound, and you work your way through to something elaborate like that. We obviously won't do that. We will build off the basics that we've talked about. We will go back very quickly and start talking about the toolbox, this idea that we have certain reactions to do certain things. If you have an alkene, you can add to it. If you need the alkene, you need to eliminate something. We've talked about bromine being a good leaving group. We've talked about resonance stabilized leaving groups. We've, we've talked about what makes a good nucleophile, what are the appropriate solvents for various reactions. So as you go back, as you would for any comprehensive final, you've got to start looking at some of the very early stuff, and I would argue that we've been, we've been doing that all the way along. We've been doing SN2 reactions all the way along. So we should be OK with this in terms of drawing reaction profiles, drawing those uh, transition states and things like this. We built over the semester, if you think about the way the textbook is organized and the way we try to present this stuff, is to build on basics and build up and get more complicated, and then hopefully demystify it. This stuff isn't mysterious. It's not magic. Uh, some of you are very good at drawing bananas. I was impressed with the uh, attempts at bananas, not so much at the chemistry. If we can swap some of the uh, talent and the banana side of things for the chemistry side of things, I'll be a happy guy. But there you go. We went back, or we, if we went back and we talked about early on, what we're trying to do is develop the limitations. What can chemistry do? What can organic molecules do? Some reactions went in a concerted sense, some reactions went in a stepwise sense, and some of them did a bit of both as we got more complicated. But the very basics, I think, you know, they are fundamental ideas that you should be able to get a hold of, and they should make some sense. So in this reaction at the top, what was this, SN1 or SN2? SN2, OK? And there were certain limitations to what we could do here. For example, this, this guy at the top, had to be uncrowded. If this thing started to get crowded, you had problems. So we're looking at methyl groups, primary groups, and maybe some secondary groups. And we saw now that a nucleophile was some negative species or something with a lone pair that was able to share that lone pair with the electrophile. You identified a delta positive carbon on, the, on here with a leaving group. Bromine's good, tosylates are good, iodides are good. And we're able to displace one and replace one thing for another. So we got a substitution process. Uh, we then saw the alternative pathway. What if you can't do an SN2? Well, maybe you can do an SN1. And the difference was when things happen. A lot of the time in the early chapters there, we talked about the steps and their, their sort of um, when they were allowed to happen. So at the top, maybe we can't get a good carbocation, so we can't do an SM1. At the bottom, we can get a decent carbocation. Holderman, what are we looking at here for carbocations? What stabilizes them? It certainly does. Thank you very much. Good night. Uh, hyperconjugation now is very important, not only in carbocations, but radicals. And one thing I was pleased with, with the people who were doing OK, was that people can see there is a definite demarcation between what a radical does and what a carbocation does. Okay? Those who are completely lost are doing both at the same time. No, that's not happening. But those of you who are starting to get this, that you know, the 65% the, uh, of the class, whatever, are going to pass, um, people are starting to see the differences. 
So at the bottom, we have the leaving group breaking off first, then some nucleophile comes in, and we had different rate determining steps. The slow step at the top in the SN2 is basically that displacement, and at the bottom, the slow step was the leaving group breaking off to form the carbon cation. So we had different graphs, and you need to be able to go back and remember how to draw those graphs. Examples of this to ex sort of exemplify this idea of inversion, the SN2, the attack has to, or the nucleophile has to approach from the back, and it has to kick out the leaving group from the front. And so we get this type of idea where you can see this with a chiral starter material. A secondary chiral starter material, you see the inversion, and in many instances, S goes to R and R goes to S. Now, there was a word for this. If the stereochemistry of the starter material dictates the stereochemistry of the product, what's the word? Again, on my final, I've got definitions. I've got, there are a few points. What does this mean? What does this mean? What does this mean? So we've got the vocabulary for the second term. And I'm not, I've said this before, and I'll say it many times um, before the end of the term. 3719 is the precursor for 3720. You can't do 3719. You have no chance in 3720. It's that simple. And you need to understand the basic principles and the terminology. So what was this? We had various instances where the stereochemistry of the start material then dictated what the outcome was. Stereospecificity, that's it, stereospecificity. And I would like people to have an example of each of these things so that on the final you can tell me what, if you know this. What is a stereospecific reaction? What is a stereoselective reaction? What is a regioselective reaction? Stuff like that. So in these examples, we had to worry about either inversion or at the bottom, racemization. At the bottom, we don't get some uh, inversion so much because we break apart into this flat planar carbocation. Uh, again, we can see now that this is prochiral. We can be attacked from either side and we can get two products based on whether we attack from left or right. And the two products on the right at the bottom, what are they called? What's the relationship between these two? They're enantiomers, right? And you get roughly 50-50 because of the equal attack on both sides, and you end up with a racemic mixture with an alpha B of what? Zero. So those are things we've seen a lot of, and they're very nice clues to be able to work out what's going on. So substitutions, if you just want to swap something out at sp3 carbon, you do, an S, you do a, a substitution reaction, be it an SN1 or an SN2. Which was more useful, SN2 or SN1? Which was more predictable? Why? What happens in SN1? Rearrangements and stuff like that, it gets a bit messy, okay? But they both, they both work. We then moved on, and we had done substitutions, then we used the same sort of substrates to do elimination chemistry and to put alkenes into molecules. And if you go back and look at those natural products on the first slide, alkenes are everywhere. You've got to be able to make alkenes in this job to be able to do this properly. So we had, again, Analogous pathways, we could go in what's called the E2, or we could go in what's called the E1 pathway, depending upon the substrate, depending upon the conditions. At the top here, is that the E1 or the E2? It's the E2, right? Both the base and the, and the electrophile are present in that reaction, and it gives you the product. Now, there were some problems with this, because the alkene isn't maybe as stable as the starter material, but often the driving force for this, the motivation for this, was the base to become stable by picking up some proton and becoming neutral, and the negative charge on that base going to the leaving group. This leaving group will be something like bromide, and bromide's happy being negative, so away we go. That's the motivation for the process. Uh, this also competed with the SN reactions, right? As you started to get more bulky substrates, and you started to think about mixing bases with tertiary systems, they couldn't do SN2. They can't do SN2, they do E2. They want to do something, and you'd have to decide which pathway they're going to go through. We then worried about the complementary example here, where we had the uh, maybe a tertiary system with a good leaving group. We didn't have a strong base, and we're able to break this thing off and form a carbocation, just like we did for the SM1. But then this changes its role. There were some examples like you did in lab. If you use HBr, you tend to get SN1 or SN2, because that's a good nucleophile, the Br minus. If you swap it out for sulfuric acid or phosphoric acid, like you did in lab, you tend to get elimination. And then we had that argument about going backwards and forwards. This thing was reversible. How do we make it go forwards? Well, you could remove the alkene, right, by distillation, because it's lower boiling. And you can raise the temperature. What does temperature do to the reaction in, in elimination? Think about the last exam. What factor are we playing on if we're trying to raise the temperature in elimination? Entropy, yes? You're trying to make the entropic factor worth more so that you get a, a negative delta G. So very, very basic ideas that we have uh, built on and we're now starting to use. After we did alkenes, we started to use them. We started to add things to them. And you can see here now we've finished that story. We, we, early on, we said Markovnikov addition was all about carbocations. Is this regiochemistry or is this stereochemistry? Regiochemistry, right? Where the thing happens. And the regiochemistry up here is dictated by wanting the better intermediate. And what is the intermediate in that reaction? A carbocation, a, a radical, a banana, what is it? It's a carbocation, right? So you want the tertiary carbocation to be better than the primary. So that's why the proton goes here first, then the Br- minus goes to the tertiary system. Now, having done all of this last week, we can now say at the bottom 
The mechanism changes fundamentally. What are we changing to here? What are the intermediates? They're radicals, right? They are radicals. Now, radicals are going to have similar properties to carbocations cations in that you prefer the secondary more than the tertiary. Sorry, you prefer the tertiary more than the secondary more than the primary. But it's how the mechanism runs and it's how things add and when they add that changes the outcome. So in this example, we generate BR radical. It adds first. And it does look like the anti Markovnikov product. But you'd have to then argue it went through the better radical. So both of those systems are kind of parallel. At the top, you had a carbocation, which you prefer the tertiary. At the bottom, you have a radical, which you prefer the tertiary. That's where things start to either make sense or they go completely wrong. So we now have additions. Addition reactions take sp2 to sp3. And of course, if you have like a carbocation, you have uh, a flat system, you're going to get a racemic mixture. If you have an alkene, flat system, you get a racemic mixture. You can start to build up complexity here and start to look at some fairly interesting molecules. So this is the same picture from earlier. Once you've generated the carbocation in an addition reaction, you can get a racemic mixture of products. So that overlaps with the SN1 reaction. And your job is to keep it all straight. In terms of um, thinking about the products that are formed, looking at the starter material. You know, if you've got symmetry, maybe you don't get uh, enantiomeric mixtures. If you don't have symmetry and you've got prochirality, maybe you can get these two things. So these are useful reactions to be able to go from sp2 to sp3 and to make the world sort of go from flat to being three-dimensional. We had an alternative to do uh, hydrolysis. We can either add acid and uh, water, and that gives us addition through the Markovnikov process. Or at the bottom, the whole point of this system was not to rearrange. That set of reagents avoids rearrangement and gives you uh, essentially what is the um, Markovnikov product without any carbocations doing silly things. Everybody all right? Big time of the year, pressure time. Okay. If you want to switch the regiochemical outcome, we don't want to add the water or the OH group to the more substituted carbon. We want to switch them. We have to change the mechanism. And what was the background to this mechanism? It wasn't about carbocations, right, for most of you. What was it about? What was the driving factor here for the change in regiochemistry if we saw it? The size of the reagents, right? The steric environment of the reagent wanting to avoid big bulky groups. In this example, it's not such a big deal because they're both the same carbon. But if you put a methyl group up here, you definitely get regiochemistry and regioselectivity. And that was all based on this idea of, do we want to have uh, transition states which are basically uh, high energy or low energy? Do we want things to clash or things to avoid each other? And there are starting to be quite a number of clues out there that you should be able to use on the final to work out what the mechanism should be, even if you've forgotten it. How do we know it's not a plus charge? If you add this thing over here, if you add the OH and the H on the same side, how do you know that it can't be a plus charge? What would happen to molecules like this if it went through a carbocation? They can attack from both sides, right? And you can rotate and things like that. You lose the stereochemical integrity of what you started with. So the fact that this gave you a syn addition tells you it was a concerted mechanism. Big clues that we've been developing for a while now. Uh, transition states there to show you that you'd rather have the one on the left and not the one on the right because of the steric environment. Things we've done. Feel free to stop me at any point. But I'm just going to rattle through this stuff. I'm going to get to 11.30, and then we'll give you the test back. Your job over the break, once you wake up, is to study the reactions. Go back and see where you went wrong on the previous exams. Do some synthesis, because that's what the final's about. So what was this about? What's the type of addition here for hydrogen? It's a syn addition, right? What does that suggest to you in terms of probably what's happening in the mechanism? It's probably a concerted process, just like it was for the hydroboration. And we can do similar things with, with bromine. Now, bromine isn't a polar reagent until you put it next to an alkene. And then all of a sudden, things happen. Now, what was the outcome here? What's the magic word here? What's the type of stereochemistry that's happening? It's an anti-addition. That anti-addition suggested that the bromine wasn't adding to give a carbocation, because carbocations would add from top or bottom. You get syn and you get anti. But in this case, you only get the anti, so that tells you you had a three-membered ring intermediate. You had the positive bromonium ion, which then got attacked, and we ended up with an uh, anti-trans product. Uh, that, that isn't very useful, other than making alkynes. Maybe you can make alkynes of these things. But it was a stereochemical outcome that was key. The fact that you got not the syn addition, but you got an anti addition to show you an example of that. This was a mixture. Okay, this is one of the questions on the test. I asked you to explain with diagrams, which usually means draw some pictures, please, um, the stereochemical differences in those two reactions. One was a syn addition, one was an anti addition. And this reaction is particularly interesting, but also confusing, because you're getting both, but not in the same steps. What is this type of addition here? Give me a word that describes that first addition in terms of the stereochemistry. It's a syn addition, absolutely. But then what's happening in the second reaction? Anti. 
Now we're starting to piece things together. This is more indicative of the second term heading into biochemistry later. You can add these things together however you want, and you'll get you know, more useful processes using the same type of ideas, but now we're starting to mix them up. If it was confusing before, it will be more confusing now. Uh, transition states, to draw this, you know, transition states are very much an important part of the final, be able to draw them. You'll see at least one reaction you haven't seen before, and your job is to tell me whether you can handle it or not. If you just sit there and shake your head and that's it, then, then game over. If you have a go at it, then we're thinking about 3720, which is much more fun because the audience is a bit more attentive, uh, we're down to the better students, and we can get going, we can get stuff done. So in this example, the transition state, you know, you can see it's uh, fairly complicated in terms of the arrows, but it's actually fairly straightforward in terms of that uh, transition state. You're just delivering the O onto the oxygen, both at the same time, the bonds are forming, and we end up with an epoxide. So with these things in mind, we have a lot of tools to be able to use. We could do syn dihydroxylation by adding OSO4. Uh, we'd recognize that this produces something like this, this intermediate species. And both of the O's have added at the same time. Now, you think about that. If you try and add one O at the top, and then you try and add the other O underneath at the same time, what's that likely to happen? Is that likely to happen? You know, you're one O up here, and all of a sudden you're trying, Urgh! what's going to happen there? Give me a word that describes that attempt. Strained, good, strained, right? It's too strained to do that. It adds both at the same time, and it gives you that cis dial. So what we've done, I hope you, know, you, you start to appreciate this, we have a toolbox, we have a toolkit. We have lots of reactions to be able to manipulate carbon functionality and the functional groups on carbon systems to be able to get products. So on the exam, I don't think we saw this as a mechanism, but we saw it in terms of synthesis. This is a unique reaction in terms of what we've done this, this semester. What is happening in this reaction is that you're breaking carbon bonds apart. I think it's the only time we did that. Yeah? And on the homework out there for um, 11 and, and think for 12, there'll be some of this idea. If you recognize that you're trying to put carbons together, what type of chemistry do you use? If you're trying to make a longer chain of carbons, what do you use? Alkynes. If you want to break things apart, what do you use so far? Ozonolysis, right? So you've got ways of doing this in both directions. Um, to make alkynes themselves, all we're doing here is cataloging what we've done. This is uh, basically the first three exams. We've all seen all these reactions so far. If you want to make an alkene, you eliminate. If you want to make an alkyne, you eliminate twice. A lot of people got this right on the exam, which is pleasing because it's useful. Um, then what we start to do is add things to the alkynes. We can manipulate the system to make either alkenes or make bromides, whatever you want, make ketones, make aldehydes. And we saw things like this. What was the name for this reagent at the top? Lindlar's catalyst, right? Lindlar's catalyst stops at the alkene because it's not reactive enough to take the alkene to the alkane. Then at the bottom, there was a sodium ammonia reduction. Be careful, this is not NaNH3. It's not all one molecule. It is sodium in ammonia. The sodium is a source of electrons to reduce the double bond. The, H, the NH3 is a source of H's to reduce the double bond with hydrogens. Right? They're separate molecules. But that gives you a chance now to do stereoselective chemistry. You can make either the cis or the trans isomer depending upon what you start with. This was OK on the test. Not brilliant, but you know, it was OK. Um, we have methods to take alkynes to carbonyls. Very powerful. You can go from different families. There's a simple alkane, alke, uh, alkyne which is a hydrocarbon, turning it into a biologically active ketone. Very, very simple, very useful chemistry. And this first part is fairly straightforward. Pick up protons, pick up OH, end up with the enol. And in this example, we ended up with a ketone. And one of the questions I asked, and part of it for some points, was why do you get a ketone, not an aldehyde? And a lot of, quite a lot of people said, well, because these conditions give you a ketone. That doesn't work. That's not an explanation, right? That's not an explanation. The reason being, you want to put the charge on the secondary light carbon, which is more stabilized than the primary light carbon. That's the regiochemical drive for that reaction and why it gave you the ketone. After that, tautomerism. Pick up a proton, do some resonance, pick off the proton, you have the ketone. And we can use that for aldehydes as well if we want to do this with uh, the parachute. Again, the driving force here is to avoid big things hitting each other. And so we've got the parachute here adding to the alkyne at this end this time, and then exactly the same mechanism as you did for the alkene. The nice thing about 11 was it was repeating a lot of 10. If you understood 10, 11 wasn't so bad. Um, you can see here the peroxide and the hydroxide will get rid of the boron, replace it with an OH, and all of a sudden we get to the aldehyde. The reason this gave you an aldehyde and not a ketone is not because of positive charges, it's because of steric environment and a lower transition state to get to that addition product. Okay, then we started knitting things together. All we're doing today is reviewing what you should know. We'll take a break, eat some turkey, fall asleep, whatever you want, Get, wake, wake up, 
and then read this stuff because we're going to finish this on uh, the last week of classes and it's pretty intense. If you want to add carbons to carbons, the only real way you have it in the first semester is by doing alkyne chemistry. And you need a certain type of alkyne. You need an alkyne at the end of a chain, a terminal alkyne. And its proton here is, is what? What's the acidity? What's the pK approximately? 25. So if I take a strong base like NH2 minus and I can rip this thing off, I'll make NH3 with a pK of about 38. So that works. It give, gives you this. Very powerful nucleophile. And a very powerful nucleophile in SN2 reactions. So you can take an alkyl halide and do an SN2 and kick this thing out, and all of a sudden you've got a longer chain. And that's an awful, that's a huge job in organic chemistry. Next semester is largely about doing that. It's about making bigger molecules and then doing biosynthesis to make biological molecules. So in the lab, we have this example now of being able to deprotonate and then alkylate. And then later on, we can manipulate this thing by doing functional group manipulations, and we can end up with elaborate products. Well, what we finished off with before the test was radical chemistry. The radical chemistry we see is, is pretty straightforward. There are two or three examples of where things happen. We need to worry about things like regioselectivity. Why does it go here and not here? We need to worry about radical reactivity. Why do you get better reactions with bromination and, and, and less clean reactions, more messy reactions, if you like, uh, with the chlorination? And that's all based on radical stabilities. So at the top, I get 97% of my secondary product, only three of my primary product, all based on the fact that the bromine is more selective because it's more stable. And the rate determining step for that reaction was endothermic as opposed to exothermic. And you see more selectivity in that step for the bromination reaction. Uh, you could do this in the opposite sense. You can also do um, what we call an anti Markovnikov addition using HBr. You can make bromides now. Now, uh, things are getting better on the exams for the people who are doing OK. What does bromine tend to do in the organic world? I'll do that again. It leaves. So if you've got a leaving group in your starter material, and then you do some reaction, and your bromine is still in your product, what didn't it do? It didn't leave. What should it have done? See ya, right? So make it leave. We've got lots of chemistry now to be able to do all sorts of stuff. This slide is just a summary of where we've been. And you'll notice now the centrality of various functional groups. And in the, in the sort of half hour I get in restation next week, and, and as many, you know, as long as you want in office hours, if you're going to show up to office hours, we'll point out some simple ideas. You can go lots of different places now from different molecules. You can make alkenes from here to here. You can make alkenes from here to here. You can open alkenes up through that. And the very first thing you should be doing over the break is making sure you can fill in all the reagents for that. On the final, there's always a fairly simple page. You know, page 34 or 38, whatever it is. Um, give me the reagents that do these reactions. So as a measure of whether you can handle that or not, have a go at this slide. What do you need to get from here to here? HBr with peroxides. What about from here to here? HBr on its own. What about from there to there? Ozonolysis, here to here. OSO4. Make sure you can do those. If you can't, you're basically taking a German language test and you only know three words of German, like I did when I was 16. There you go. Those are the procedures, those are the methods you need to be able to do. But we're going to add a twist. We're going to add a twist of make this for me. Make this product. This product is important. This slide here is just the same thing with a, you know, my take on it. Those are all the reactions we have seen. And I can show now that I can go in different directions. I can go from alkenes to alkanes. I can go from alkenes to bromides. I can go from bromides to alkenes to alkynes. We can go lots of different places based on, let's say this carefully, based on a fairly limited set of reactions. We haven't done a lot yet. We certainly haven't done half of the reactions in 3719 that we have to worry about for the whole term, the whole two semesters. There are a lot of reactions in 3720 that allow you to do different things. So what I'll finish off with today and then give the exam back is this idea of the last week of class. We save this because it's the best stuff, right? It will be your favoritist. Organic synthesis is a challenge. It's a little puzzle. If you like puzzles, if, you know, this is why we do science, presumably. We like solving problems, right? Solving puzzles or engineering. Um, we want to be able to manipulate these molecules that were given to be able to make things that might be more useful. So if I start out with this on the left and I want to make this on the right, What's the very first thing you would do here? Count. Count the carbons and see how many you need. And that should give you a clue. That should say, all right, I need to make a carbon-carbon bond. Therefore, I've done my homework. I need to do alkyne chemistry. So once you've decided what you want to do, it's then a matter of when do you want to do it? OK, when do you want to do it? And that's a large part of the training. You think about what you want to do as scientists or engineers. At some point in your lives, if you get through this whole thing, you're going to have to make decisions. And for some of you, those decisions will be life or death decisions for people, 
right? And the last thing you want to do with people is, you know, make the wrong decision. So we're training to get better at this. We're training to sort of make these decisions properly and be careful. The first thing you need to do is to take off that proton. So what do you need? You need a strong base, right? You need a strong base to do so. And then you're going to start doing SN2 chemistry. Why have I got propyl bromide? Because I need three carbons. It's as simple as that. That's the alkyne. It's not the alkane. What do I need to finish this off with? H2PD, right, to finish this off, and that gives you the alkane. So I'm going to leave it there. That's the next week, the last week of classes.